doing that. Well, um, I'd like to welcome everybody tonight. I wish I could see your faces because um, I like to see who it is that I'm, I'm speaking to. Uh, my name is Wendy Reiner. I am the education chair of the Orleans Audubon uh, Society. I do this kind of this kind of program. I you may have seen me at the uh, East Bank Regional Main Branch Library. Um, I've done several programs there. I've done programs other, in other places throughout the city. So if I look familiar, that may be why. Um, just a little bit about myself. Um, I am retired. I just re retired in May. I taught at Delgado for 30 years. Um, I taught English there. So I'm not a scientist uh, by trade. I am liberal arts tra uh, training, trained rather. Um, but I started birding in 1997. And I was thinking about that today. I was thinking that there might be some participants that have logged on that weren't even born yet in 1997. I always find that kind of amazing. But anyway, in 1997, I was a volunteer out at uh, uh, Baratariya Preserve of Jean Lafitte National Historical Park and Preserve. I um, was doing litter patrol. That was my first volunteer duty. And I was out with my, my litter grabber and my bag. And I was suddenly dive bomb by this bird. I heard this commotion above my head and I felt these little pricks on my head. Of course I had my volunteer hat on so it must not have, I must not have felt it that hard but I looked up and there was this bright yellow lemon yellow canary yellow bird just you know chipping away at me you know griping 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 and I didn't know what it was. I've always liked birds, but I didn't, you know, have any clue what that was. So when I got back to the visitor center after I picked up all the litter, I looked up in the field guide and I saw that it was a prothonotary warbler. And I had noticed that um, when I was out on the trail that I had gotten too close to its nests. Prothonotaries yeah. are, are cavity nesters and I had gotten too close <laughs> can we mute jennifer can can we mute i've gotten too close to its nest and i understand now that i had really angered it and ever since then i've been bitten i've been smitten and bitten as i like to say um and it's never, my life has not really been the same since, and I'm very thankful that that bird got mad at me. So tonight um, is a first in two classes, as, as Jennifer has mentioned. Back uh, before COVID, Jennifer and I would team teach this class at the Unitarian Church on um, Fleur de Lis Drive, Avenue, whatever it is over there in Lake Lakeview, and we'd do the same kind of thing. It would be my class experience and then her second class experience and then we go out on some field trips well obviously we um can't do the field trips right now maybe soon enough we'll be able to do those so this is in lieu of that um anyway so tonight our agenda is pretty much it's pretty straightforward i want to talk a little bit about the whys and what do you need and i want to speak a little bit of migration again i am not a scientist i'm not an ornithologist um, so if you have any of those questions, please refer them to Jennifer. <laughs> um, but I will, I will talk a little bit about those things because one of the things Jennifer and I spoke about when we were in the preliminary stages of doing this Zoom program was March is the beginning of when we're starting to look for things and I, I should say birds. Um, Jennifer was speaking previously uh, this evening about the swallowtailed kites beginning they're migrating um, into the area so this is the this is a great point um, to to start talking about migration and and why some birds are here and why some birds aren't here and all that kind of good stuff and then of course i i am on the board of directors of the native plant initiative of greater new orleans so i am going to do a shameful plug for npi i have their website up later we'll take a look at that um and and uh <clears throat> excuse me so we are going to talk a little bit about gardening with natives so why look at birds in the first place well 
scientists have known this for quite some time and there's a lot of research out there on bird watching, <coughs> excuse me, how it relieves stress, relaxes us, calms us, puts us, us at ease. In fact, um, you can see here the Science Daily report that discovered that people who live in neighborhoods with more birds and more shrubs and more trees are less likely to suffer from depression and anxiety and stress and all those things that are brought about by living in the city. Um, birding also promotes this mindfulness that so many people are looking for. So whatever troubles you have in your life, when you're out there looking at the birds in your area and on your street or in a park, city park or, or, or Jean Lafitte, the mindfulness forces you, it confines you in that moment. You're in that present moment and you can't think about the bills or the wayward children or whatever it may be. So it's a, it's a serious way of taking your mind off things and making you focus only on the moment. Also, um, this I discovered because Unfortunately, we had to put my mother in an assisted facility um, and she's uh, been deceased for several years now. But um, I remember when we fir first put her in the home, in the, in the home, the home um, had positioned bird feeders in various places in the common room areas. Um, there was one that happened to be right outside my mother's room. It was one of the tube feeders because my mother's room looked out into this patchwork of four of woods, uh, albeit urban woods. It had Nashville warblers in there every spring when I went up there to visit. And my mom would sit and look at the birds outside the window. And so it's something about the hand-to-eye coordination. It also promotes peacefulness in the minds of, of the residents, especially those of you who are aware of this terminology. Uh, patients, residents rather, who are sundowning. So it, it really, it does wonders for our psychoses, our brains, our mental states. Also, bird watching opens all of these new doors. I can't tell you how many doors have been opened for me since I've, I've been bird watching. Um, uh, my friend Jane told me that she started out as a gardener and then she became a bird watcher. For me, it was the reverse. I started out as a birder. I love gardens, but you know, I, I wasn't a gardener. But then I started becoming more interested in, interested in gardening when I realized the connection between birds in the yard and the plants that I had. So um, I am not only obsessed with birds, but now I am thoroughly obsessed with native plants and uh, what they do. And we'll talk about that as well. Also, you become an advocate. You don't only become an advocate for birds, but you become an advocate for us here in New Orleans and Louisiana, I should say, because as I like to say, um, the coast is bird habitat and human habitat and what birds need, we need. Uh, just as a brief digression, when I was when I was teaching right after the storm in 2007, one of my advanced composition classes wrote a pamphlet for a National Audubon Society's program called Important Bird Areas. And the students in that class learned so much about birds, they never even had thought about birds. And one student actually, I don't know if she's still doing it, but she actually went out bird watching and, and she was an animal lover and she was worried about what was gonna happen to birds. And so it, you just, your whole life, your focus changes. Um, it introduces us to new people. I've met some wonderful people in New Orleans, in Louisiana, um, I still have some good friends in Ohio and Cleveland. I'm originally from Cleveland and after Katrina, we evacuated up there and I met all kinds of birders up there and they're my friends and it's just great. It's wonderful. And then for those of you who aren't scientific like me, you are more liberal arts oriented. It does open your mind up to science and the, the things you learn. And, and one of the regrets I have is I wish I knew now yeah, I wish I knew what I know now when I was 18 and I may have tried to take science a little more seriously, but it really um, has been eye-opening for me. Okay, um, 
what is the difference? You know, there's sort of this undercurrent between what is bird watching, what is birding, what is a bird watcher, what's a birder. Um, I know some of us didn't like this movie, The, uh, the Big Year, um, with Steve Martin, Owen Wilson, and Jack Black. I have to tell you that I'd met, I had the great pleasure of meeting the gentleman, whoops, of meeting the gentleman uh, Jack Black played. I met him up at the biggest week in American birding in Northwestern Ohio. And he is actually quite a wonderful person. And he told me once something along the lines of bird watcher, bird, or it doesn't matter. Just get out there and look. I have a link here to this funny article. Oh, I'm sorry, guys. That's how not technological I am. Um, this funny article is in the Banger Daily News about the difference between bird between birding and bird watching. And um, it's kind of interesting. The author here says, I'll just read a little bit here. In my mind, it's the difference between passive and active. When finches come to my feeder and I observe them out the window, I'm a casual bird watcher. When I grab the binoculars and locate a secretive warbler sitting in the treetop above the feeder, I'm a birder. When I go for a walk and appreciate the birds I see, I'm a bird watcher. When I veer off the path and chase them into the woods, I'm a birder. And then down below here, I, I like this. Um, uh, oh, um, if you read this column, you're a bird watcher. If you disagree with anything in today's column, you're undeniably a birder. And I will send that to anybody who wants it. If you want to send me your email, I will definitely get that off to you. It's it's a good article. It's, it's tongue in cheek. It's but I I. I, I want everyone who wants to become a birder, I want everyone to understand that whatever you want to be as a bird watcher, birder, whatever the case may be, it's up to you, okay? If you want to do this casual in your yard, that's fine. We were talking before, I have a um, buff-bellied hummingbird and I have a rufous hummingbird in my yard now. And you know what? It's really nice just staying home watching them at the feeder. Um, if you want to buy a pair of binoculars and zip off to Nepal, that's great too. It's all dependent on who you are. Just that you know, when you do become a birder, bird watcher, or what I was told by a young person a couple weeks ago, now we're called bird nerds. Um, I've been called a nerd my entire life, so it doesn't bother me. You all call me a bird nerd, that's fine. In 2011, the Fish and Wildlife uh, did a, a survey that showed there were nearly 48 million birders in the United States, and those people spend money. They spend money on travel, They spend spend money on equipment, they spend money on food, seed, everything. The average birder is 53. Um, that's changing. It's changing, especially since COVID. COVID has brought about this whole new um, awakening, this renaissance of, of birding. Um, but I think average goes, the birder is still white. The birder is ten, tends to be I have to be careful with this, older. Um, but again, those demographics are changing. We know from the horrible ex experiences that summer in, in Central Park with uh, Christian Cooper. National Audubon did a market research study and showed that 9 million between the ages of 18 and 35 are interested in birds now and environmental activism and, and the statistics are very heartening. I have always said we need to diversify, we need to broaden the audience, we need to um, get a huge diversified coalition going because birds depend on us. We all know the bad news um, with climate change and things that are happening with birds. So the more people know, the better off things will be. Okay. So let's talk about some equipment. I am not a binocular expert. I am not a binocular scientist. I have not studied binoculars. I have purchased binoculars um, at times throughout the last however many years I've been birding. But the, remember the thing here is that you want to magnify. Magnifying is your goal, is your objective. But 
folks remember binoculars and you'll hear people call them bins okay so if you hear someone say bins you know what they're talking about binoculars are like cars it's your preference you can't get a pair of binoculars because i told you so i you know i i would not want you to do that you have to go by what is is good for you what fits for you what's what's friendly, user-friendly for you, you can get suggestions. When you, when we do open back up and we can go on field trips again, I know several people that will say, yeah, sure, take my binoculars, look through them, you know, jot down the brand, the, the, the specifications and all that kind of good stuff. Do that, that's great. Um, suggestions are good. The other thing um, I want everyone to understand is that use what you have. OK, if you still have your grandmother's 10 by 50s and that's all you can use right now, that's fine. This is not a competition. There are a lot of birders who make this a competition. And I'm not, you know, I'm not saying they're, that's what birding is or it's been ruined. No, I'm just saying you don't have to have $2,500 binoculars to enjoy birding or bird watching or being a bird nerd. Um, start out with what you have and you can advance to whatever you want when it's good time for you when you can however there are some things you're going to want to take note of and if you're in the market for binoculars there are some things you want to note and things you want to avoid and things you want to be careful about um, on the right hand side of the screen you see three measurements eight by 40 eight by 42 seven by 35 Okay, these are usually the measurements you want to look for when you're going to do the average bird watching. I'm not talking about going to a hawk watch if you're going to go to Hawk Mountain, Pennsylvania, or you're going to go to what is it, Hawk Ridge in um, Minnesota, or you're going to go to Beta Cruz in Mexico uh, for the River of Raptors. You don't, you know, I'm not talking about, I'm talking about if you're going to go to City Park, if you're going to go to Grand Isle, if you're going to go to Fountain Blue these are the measurements that you're going to want to have okay so now what you have let's let's look at the options you have um this is the mid-size and this is the the size you probably want to stay with for a number of reasons um the compacts are great for looking at drew Brees. Of course, some of you might want to bring the full size to the dome and look at Drew Brees, but the compacts are great for that. They're small, but they're not going to work for birding. And that's because of what you see where it says less than 30 millimeters. Okay. So I don't want to get ahead of myself, so I, I, which I can easily do, but the mid size is what you want. And then the full size, again, if you're going to Hawk Ridge, Hawk Mountain, Veracruz, Cruz, you probably, and Jennifer, you probably do have some good 10 by 50s, huh? To, to use for raptor watching. Yeah, those are some of my favorites for that, right? Yeah, you know, but I would not send you into Couturier Woods with a pair of 10 by 50s. You're, it, won't, it won't be so easy, and plus they're heavy. Um, one of the things that about these binoculars that I find fascinating, and, and again, I've been doing this for a while and I still don't know, so that goes to show you my priority about learning about binoculars probably isn't where it needs to be. But if you look at the mid binocular, the middle one, okay, oops, those are called um, roof prism binoculars, and if you notice, the barrels are all in line, so the light that's coming into your binocular doesn't have to bend and go around like it does in the Poro prism, okay? So if I, I'm looking through my binoculars and, and I, I can't, I rather would rather be with you because I can't tell you what to do on your binoculars. I can't show you here, obviously, but you'll notice that the middle image everything goes straight to your eyes and these are also much lighter okay much much lighter the neck strap makes it easy to carry these and and by the way these are nikons and these are eight by 42 i'm sorry nikon monarch seven um this is called considered a mid-range binocular these were I don't like to talk numbers. These were $372, okay? Um, but it's a Monarch 7, Nikon Monarch 7. I love these binoculars. Um, 
anyway. So the compact ones, we don't really, we, if that's what you have to start out with, start out with those. And then if you go on a field trip and you ask to borrow someone's midsize, you'll see why compacts won't work for you. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Uh, my mom swore by her poro prisms, the, the full-size ones. I mean, she, she kind of looked like she belonged in the Battle of Somme. You know, World War I, she'd walk around these huge binoculars. I don't know how, how she could carry them, but she swore by them. So, but I'm going to push you for the midsection here. Okay, so what is all this? Why? Why does it all matter? Well, what's important is at the end of your binoculars, okay, these objective lens here, if you'll notice, look how much light is let into these binoculars. So a much more light comes into these than the ones you're looking at Drew Brees in the Superdome with, okay? So these, look at the, the opening here, the objective lens here, how small it is. Your, your field of view might be okay. Field of view meaning the area in which you're looking at, a, at, at you know, the bird or the squirrel or the rabbit, whatever, might be okay, but there's not brightness coming in. Okay, where there is on the mid one. Um, <clears throat> so you want the, the second number, whether it's, seven, whether it's 35 or 8 by 40 or 8 by 42, the second number is the objective lens. Okay, and that's allowing that light to come in. Now the 8, the 7 is the magnification. The bird, if you have, let's say, 7 by 35, the bird is sometimes closer to you. Or if you have, these are eight by 42. So if uh, I'm looking at this in Couturier with John and he says, oh, the cerulean warbler's there, the bird is eight times closer to me with these eight by 42s, okay? Um, eight by 42s, by eight by 47 by 35s will work anywhere for you. Now, not, not on Hawk Mountain or, I mean, you'll see the bird, but you won't see it like you will if you're using um, this one here, okay? The other thing about these uh, binoculars, I find them to be, I have very small hands, and so I find these to be very user-friendly. Um, but I'm an eyeglass wearer. I don't wear my contacts so much anymore since COVID. But if you are a glass eyeglass wearer, you want to make sure that you're finding binoculars that are going to be comfortable for your eyes. And that's why I like Nikon binoculars. I think um, they really do work well for those of us who are wearing eyeglasses. I also have a pair of Zeiss uh, binoculars. Um, I actually don't like looking through them as much as I do through these. Um, but the eye cup is very important. So if you're wearing binocular, if you're wearing glasses rather, you want an eye cup, eye cup that you're either going to twist up if you've got binoculars on, glasses on, or twist down if you're going to be wearing contacts. Um, some glasses will have a fold over, a rubberized uh, eye cup, okay? Now, the one thing you want to do is what you want to remember when you get your binoculars, and this is where I wish we were in person, is that practice in your backyard. I, believe it or not, when I first started out, now mind you, I had to get new ones because I lost them all in Katrina. See my little Audubon hummingbird, right? I would put this somewhere in a tree or a bush outside and keep my focus trained on it. So um, I'd look for some geographical sign or geographical marking near where the bird is so I can train my eyes to look there first and then raise up the binoculars. If you spend all your time doing this with binoculars, you're going to end up seeing nothing. So you obviously want to look for the bird first and practice if you have a feeder in your backyard, practice. Um, birds have wings, so birds will move. They don't really care that you haven't gotten your binoculars trained on them. That's not their problem. Um, so practice will make perfect. And obviously, um, you want to practice with your focusing, your central control knob, your diopter. And here, here here's my diopter for works on my focusing. 
my binoculars tend to be pretty much steadily focused in the same way because it's always me using them and I'm almost always wearing glasses now. Um, that may change. Um, <clears throat> all right, let me. Um, another th thing about binoculars, there are some considerations, obviously, you want to take into mind of what your budget Remember, this is not a competition. Um, I taught a bird watching class, this, this class that we spoke of with Jennifer um, a number of years ago. This may have been right after the storm. And a gentleman in the class came to the first field trip with a pair of Swarovskis. Uh, th those are, you're looking anywhere from 1800 up. So if that's your budget, hey, that's great. Again, if it's not, don't worry about it. Um, I do have some suggestions about where to get binoculars. I was talking with my husband earlier. My first pair of binoculars I bought were Bushnells. Bush and then like the name Nell, Bushnell, all one word. And they were great. They make fantastic beginning bird watchers for really low prices. And I don't know if y'all remember Security Sporting Goods there. I, almost a clear view on vets and I walked in and they let me try out binoculars. Those days aren't, I, I don't know if you can do that at Cabela's anymore. I don't know. Um, uh, Lakeside Camera used to have, used to carry Nikons, but the gentleman there told me nobody was buying them. So they stopped selling them. Um, do you wear glasses? So think about that. Think about your, they call it eye relief, okay? Do you want a bird on a boat so you're going to need waterproofing? Any binocular over $200 should be fog and waterproofed already, okay? Um, folks, be very careful of getting on these optics websites. You know how you walk in New York City and they have all these camera stores and you'll look into the camera stores, but it has binoculars. You don't know whether those were dropped and they were found at the bottom of the Atlantic and refurbished. You, you kind of want to stay away from that kind of thing. Um, um, so where do you want a bird? will be very important. Where are you gonna spend most of your time will be very important. And again, are you gonna go on a hawk watch? If you have back issues, this little thing down here is supposed to be a back strap. I have back issues and I have yet to get one of these things because I'm really slow on the uptake, but I've seen people use them and, and it helps. So I'll make sure, and you could Google that kind of stuff and find um, websites that deal with those things. So I just wanted to give you an idea of what's out there and the prices. And Amazon does sell, they're not refurbished, they're not re whatever, re anything, but they do sell some binoculars on Amazon. Um, I'm really disappointed. This company here, Astronomics, um, used to be called Christopher's LTD. And when we first started teaching this class, I referred many people there because they had great gentlemen who helped um, people inquiring about binoculars. They have since been sold and someone else runs it and it's not the same. Um, like everything else, everything changes. But anywhere from Nikons to Vortex, um, here you see your Leicas and your Swarovski. So if you're in that kind of um, bracket, fine. Also, I've posted here a link and by all means, take photographs, folks. I'm used to my students would always take photographs of everything. Um, the Audubon website does a pretty good job of rating low, um, uh, I don't, know, I don't know what they call them, mid-range, um, lower than mid-range, upper range, stratospheric range binoculars. And you might want to take a look through that and, and see what helps you. Um, okay, so obviously practice, practice, practice. Um, here are, you know, the the way you're gonna see birds is gonna be very frustrating. You're gonna hear people like John or Joelle or myself say things like, oh, my neck, you know, I've got warbler neck. Well, if you're looking at these two warblers on the left and I believe, ah, I believe both of these birds were taken by Joan Garvey, I think on our left. 
Um, or if you're looking at this flycatcher in the sky that looks like today's sky, look at that. You know, you can't, the sky does not help you illuminate or highlight the bird. So you just want to practice. And frustration is going to be your friend for a little bit. You're just going to get frustrated. You're going to miss birds um, because you didn't train your binoculars on it. Folks, I still have that problem. Okay, um, as I say, birding patience is indeed a virtue. And don't cut yourself, don't uh, cut yourself down. Uh, just be prepared that these things happen and, and practice. Practice, practice, practice. Okay. All right. So you're, you've got a pair of binoculars. You've been out birding. What are you going to look at? Well, I'm an English professor, folks. I am old school as it gets. I still love books. I like an actual book. I remember my students looking at me like I was talking about the Parthenon or something. Books are still very, very good, all right? Um, I've had the great pleasure of meeting Ken Kaufman. I actually went birding with him in Milwaukee a few years back, um, and he autographed my uh, Kaufman guide field guide to birds in Spanish, because he's written one in Spanish. He's got one in Spanish, one in English. Um, I like that field guide, and I like it for beginners, Ken Kaufman's field guide. Uh, I think it's, it's his, his renderings are part photograph and part drawings. Um, and if you're a Spanish speaker, it's it, the, the Spanish one is great because it teaches you the um, names of the birds. The one I use is the one to the left, and it's the uh, National Geographic. That is my favorite field guide. And I will tell you, it. this is a post-Katrina one because I, I lost the one in the storm. But the biggest year, that movie with... Uh, uh, Steve Martin and, and others, those gentlemen, many of the listers, and listers are those people who have the resources to go fly in a plane and find a rare bird in Alaska. Um, they could buy a ticket on the same day they hear a bird is in California. And they're called listers. And they tend to use the National Geographic because National Geographic also includes a lot of the vagrants that come from Mexico or that come from the Caribbean. I will tell you, I'm not a big fan of Sibley. I know that's almost like sacrilegious. I probably will be egged once I leave the house. Um, I just, I don't know. I'm just not a big fan of Sibley's book. Um, I like David Sibley. He's a great guy. I also, this is really sacrilege. I'll probably put in the stocks. I'm not fond of Peterson either. Roger Torrey Peterson. I hope he's not listening. Um, but as I said, the National Geographic is my favorite. But then you can even get more specialized. The Warbler Guide is a great field guide. Uh, my friends in Ohio, whenever I go up to the biggest week in American birding, they have several of those stations so that you can look through them. You can get very specific. Uh, the American Birding Association, I'm not sure if Joelle can answer that. I'm not sure if they're still putting out these field guides. Uh, birder's Guide to Finding Birds. They have these great books about where you can find, if you're in Southern California, where you can find these birds. Um, and there are quite a few of them. And there was one supposed to be coming out for La Louisiana, wasn't there? Am I, am I mistaken on that one? Uh, the Louisiana one came out several years ago. And yes, you can still get the ABA guides. But they're, they're useful only for traveling, you know, if you yeah. want to travel. Yeah. Both. Arizona, something you find out where to go. If you if you are going to Arizona, let's say you have to go for a business meeting, why not? Right now, um, I'm not so old school that I don't use apps on my phone. I do have apps on my phone. Um, I am fond of iBird. I use that one. It's got great pictures, great videos, um, songs. The um, uh, let me show you this. A range map is a map and a field guide that will show you the range of the bird. So let's say you're in Couturier and you see a red warbler sized bird with white on its cheeks, white spots on its cheeks, you can look through your field guide and if, it, if you have the National Geographic and you can say, see that that bird is not in range. And that's what a field uh, a range map does for you. 
Um, well, iBird's got great range maps. I like that. And iBird costs, at least when I got it, it cost $19. It takes a little bit to download because there are so many videos on it and things like that, but I really like it. I don't use Merlin, but I've known people who have used Merlin and they, they like it a lot and it's very user friendly and you could plug in color and shape and what time of the year you saw it and um, where you saw it and size and all that stuff. And it'll give you some choices of, of what it is that you've seen. The good thing about field guides and apps and all that stuff. And one thing that makes me really weird as a birder, I know, is that when I'm done birding, I like to go eat. <laughs> and I like to sit and look at whatever I've seen and study what the field guide says about it and look at the range maps and, and then work on my list and all that kind of stuff, because it's, it's just fun. Um, the one here on the bottom left is Song Sleuth, and I've never used that before, and I just downloaded it a couple weeks ago. Um, I'm not a great birder by ear. There are some people who can hear two chip notes, and I'm assuming, Jennifer, you're going to talk about songs and singing next week, but there are people who can hear two chip notes or hear two seconds of a bird song and tell you what it is. I am not one of those. I have to hear a little more. Um, but Song Sleuth is an app that will help you learn the bird songs. And it also has a way that you can record as long as the recording is going to be clear enough, you know, for you to be able to hear it. But I I'm going to try it this spring and I'm going to see what happens and see how it works. But don't get like me and lose a bird because your face is plugged into your phone. Um, birding should be a time where we get off the phone. Um, where we put the phone down. I remember I was in Couturier two years ago, this April, and a woman came in with binoculars and her iPad. And I, I could not understand how she was going to bird with her iPad. And she said, well, I just put the iPad down and I look for the bird. And I said, well, you, you know, ma'am, that birds have wings and they may be gone by the time you look for it. So it's probably good to let the technology go for a while. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about eBird. Um, I am not the best person to, to recommend eBird. I use it, but I'm not a devotee. I'm not totally faithful. Um, I have moments where I don't want to upload things. I have a lot of lists I've never uploaded. Um, but eBird is pretty cool. I will say that I when I use it, I really like it. I'm just not consistent. I'm probably not consistent in anything, so eBird shouldn't be any different. But um, it's a user-friendly way to upload your sightings and also to participate in citizen science. So you go out to Couturier, you go out to Wisner Tract, you go out to you know Jean Lafitte, you see some birds, you, you upload it, and I'm gonna show us how to do these things. If you don't, if you, have made a mistake and you've uploaded an incorrect bird, or let's say you've uploaded a um, red warbler, okay, well, yeah, the, the local reviewer, the regional reviewer is going to send you a nice email and say, mm, can you pro provide some documentation for this, that this is what you saw, blah, blah, blah. That's happened to me a number of times. Um, uh, it's a great way to explore what's being seen, not only in your area, but let's say you get a wild hare and you want to go see what's being seen in Mexico. You want to see what's being seen down in southern Mexico. It's a great way to explore. And also for those of you who are worried about paper and the environment, it's a good way to go paperless. So let's take a look at eBird um, for a minute. So um, registering is not difficult. It's very easy to register. Um, it's, it's it, for me, being a techno dinosaur, I have to say it's fairly user friendly. Now you'll notice my eBird stats aren't so hot because I, again, I haven't uploaded anything. I've, this, according to this, I've only seen 900, and I don't mean to say it like that, I've only seen 906 birds where my list is longer than that, but I haven't uploaded. You can see I'm not a photographer. I don't play one on TV and I shouldn't because I don't take good pictures. So I haven't uploaded any of those. 
Um, you can see that I've uploaded so many checklists so far. Okay, but there are all different things you can do. One thing I just discovered today was that they have a new challenge. Every month they have an eBirder of the month challenge. And this one is that if you upload 31 complete checklists during March, now that doesn't mean you have to do it every day, but I guess if you have two or three checklists a day, whatever, and your name is drawn from the pool, you'll win a very lovely pair of Zeiss Optics. I tried February's challenge was, which was to submit a list every day of February. This woman won when I thought I should have won, but anyway. Um, so you could definitely win if you um, uh, participate. But um, it just, when, you, when you're gonna go and submit, it, and again, I, you can go ahead and do this, uh, create your own account. Um, but I'll show you what happens is it keeps all of the places that you have submitted um, lists for, okay? And you can just easily go back and recall that list. And so let's say if I'm in uh, Panama again, and I'm on the uh, Gamba Road, if I were doing that, then I would go ahead and hit continue and then be prepared to submit my list, okay? So I, I, would, I would check it out. It's, it's pretty cool. You can explore regions of the world. You can explore a species. So if I put in, for example, um, American robin, not the world's most thrilling species to look up, but let's just say, you know, coming from Cleveland, these were, everybody wanted to see these because this meant spring was on its way. Now they're there almost all year round. But you can see that there are 83,000 submissions onto eBird with photos, and some submissions have audio, so you can listen to the song of the bird. It is cool. It's cool. Now, I know a lot of folks who don't like eBird, and you don't have to use it, but it is a cool way of keeping track of what it is that you want to be looking for and what you've seen. All right. Migration. This is the happiest time. This is the most wonderful time of the year for many birders. Many birders prefer spring migration over fall migration. Jennifer will agree with me. You always said how interesting it is to do the, this class in the fall because people don't think of migration in the fall. Well, the birds go up, they have to come back, right? So migration does happen all throughout the year, really, especially here in the coast, on the uh, Gulf Coast. But migration is so cool. It's so interesting. And it's interesting when you read a lot about what the ancients thought. Like, you've all heard about the bird flying on the back, Aristotle. Was it Aristotle? The bird on the back of the goose. That's how they migrated. Hummingbirds hitching a hike on a, uh, so, you know, some bir birds migrated by digging into the ground and they pop up in the spring. And I mean, you got to give these people credit. At least they tried. Think about it. I saw these birds and now they're gone. Or these birds weren't here. And now all of a sudden the, the forest is full of red, blue, and green. How did that happen? Um, Migration is not in any lockstep fashion here, but I've got two maps here and they show you basically what we call flyways. Now, obviously a bird doesn't pay attention to human, human drawn boundaries, but birds will basically follow certain flyways in, the United, in North America. And for example, if you look at the Eastern seaboard, there are three different flyways for birds to follow, okay? And if you look on the West Coast, there are two different flyways for birds to follow. Some birds for spring migration will come up, like let's say they'll come up on the red path on the Eastern seaboard, but they'll take a more westerly path. Maybe they'll take that pinkish path back south in the fall, okay? So what we're going to be seeing very soon in just a few weeks are more and more migrants coming in. And if your yard is ready, you can attract some of these migrants to your yards. Okay, so let's uh, simplify it a bit because migration is not simple, but just for our purposes. It's genetically programmed into birds. It's as old as the hills. 
these birds are not our birds. We used to refer to these as American birds. Well, they are American birds, but now they're American in the grander term of America, North, South, Central, whatever, America birds. Birds have migrated again for eons, and you are not going to discourage them or deter them from migrating because you feed them. That's not going to happen. Okay, this is a genetically programmed thing. So there are different kinds of migrations, however. There are short distance migrants. Some will only move down a mountain. And then when spring comes back up, they move up. And the best case I know of that is a good friend of ours from Glacier National Park. Um, those of you that know me know that I've had the great pleasure of spending so many summers in Montana. Dave Benson, Ranger Dave Benson, he's a biology uh, teacher the rest of the year, but he studies white-tailed ptarmigans. That's his life bird that he studies. This is the one bird that's being affected by climate change because as we are warming up and up and up, the birds, what do you do? In the winter, you change to this brownish color so that you can't be detected by predators, right? But with my with the climate change happening, you know, you're having to go up, 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 and Food sources are changing, but this is a good example of an altitudinal migrant. And, and I've had uh, just wonderful seeing these birds. Medium distance migrants are those who will, maybe they leave Illinois or they leave Indiana or they leave Arkansas and they stop on the Gulf Coast. Now, not all ruby crown kinglets will stop in the Gulf Coast, not all yellow rump warblers will stop in the Gulf Coast, but many do, so that there's a sizable population of these birds to see. And then the long distance migrants are those like this Arctic tern here. Wow, I mean, I think about me walking three miles and I'm about ready to pass out and just fall over. I can't even imagine the trek, the migration that the Arctic tern undertakes every year. And it's interesting to think about also the black pole warbler, which is a tiny little bird. You can probably put three warblers in a regular old envelope with a, a first class stamp and mail them. This black pole warbler leaves the, the provinces in Canada and flies down and flies all the way down to South America. Think about that the next time you want to go out exercising and you feel like you can't do it. Um, so this whole thing of resident versus migratory bird. So resident species are those that are here year round, the cardinals, the morning doves, the blue jays. In Ohio, blue jays migrate. Um, one spring I was in northwestern Ohio, we were standing there and a flock of about 1,800 blue jays were flying east, west east west and they had just come in um so you're gonna have those birds that you'll see around in your yard and then your new world tropical birds your neotropical birds your orioles your warblers the hummingbirds the ruby throat hummingbird we all love so much um and then some species again like those that we've already mentioned that don't fly all, all the way south um, so this is a Ken Harris photograph, I am pleased to say, of a blue-headed vireo, which is a great uh, winter migrant. You could say winter resident, winter migrants here in the winter. I just saw two of them this past Saturday. Um, and then down below is your ruby crown kinglet. Um, you don't see the ruby crown until he gets uh, the bird gets agitated. But um, again, these are two typical winter birds, wintering birds you'll see here in um, the New Orleans area. Okay, so, so quickly, so, sorry folks, quickly some migration facts. So it's all triggered by physiology, okay? And it's nature's way of ensuring the bird's reproductive success because you don't want to stay in Cleveland until January. I can assure you of that, right? Migration takes place all year round, but most prominently people think of spring and fall. Uh, migration can start as early as late June with birds who have finished breeding up in the Arctic and they're on their way back. And birds will build up fat 
reserves so that they can fly, usually under the breast. And Jennifer's going to talk about this more, but you have to fly a long ways. And if you don't have, have those fat preserves, you're not going to make it. So um, I have noticed that my, and Jennifer, I'm not sure if this is true, this is just my informal scientific observation, that my buff-bellied hummingbird is spending a lot less time at the feeder and more in the oak tree eating spiders and things like that. Now, you know, it could be getting ready to take off and leave me. So they have to do this, they know this, and you are not deterring them. I am not worried about confusing this bird by keeping my feeders up. Um, again, just migration is a way that birds can avoid that stress of when food sources drop in Ohio in the winter, it's time to get out. Okay, the, the daylight hours lessen, shorten, that's another clue. Um, okay. Interesting thing is that males, and you figure this out. I mean, I mean, think about this rather. It makes sense. Males winter, male species winter farther north than females do and juveniles, so they get first dibs, right? So if you're at a buffet with me, me, and you see me close to the buffet, you know why I'm sitting close to the buffet. Well, it's not too dissimilar, right? Hey, why do I, why would I want to take longer to get there? I have to get up there. I have to get the territory first. I have to be there and stake my claim, right? But it's interesting enough that the, uh, where females are larger, and Jennifer will talk about this, as in many birds of prey, raptors, females are larger, or where females are dominant, the polyandrous spotted sandpiper, and polyandrous just means she goes from mate to mate to mate to mate, um, they will also um, migrate farther north. Um, okay, all right, this is cool, folks. This is really, really cool. This is BirdCast. Again, it's put out by Cornell, the same people who have um, the eBird. This, you'll want to start and I would write this down, BirdCast live migration maps, because this tells you where the birds are on the move. Now, right now, it's not really, there's not much happening. These might be movements of what, cedar wax wings or robins or something like that. But soon, you'll see the Gulf Coast colored in hopefully oranges and yellows and things like that. So this is really cool. It's BirdCast live migration maps. And if you're a radar junkie, you really will get into this. Um, and they are definitely in real time. Okay. All right. So what happens in migration is something and um, I have not had the pleasure as, as many of these as some other birders will have had is witnessing a fallout. And that is when, you know, the clash of fronts, warm and cold, create these, these thunderstorms. Like, for example, I was in City Park one April and just a huge thunderstorm and out of the sky seemed to come all of these birds. Okay. So this is, we're not going to watch the whole thing, obviously, but this is just what happened in High Island, Texas, you know, east of Houston out there, what happened in a fallout in 2013 when they recorded, ah, when they recorded, I'm sorry about this folks, 294 species of birds. So you lay out fruit, in this case oranges, you get a lot of Tennessee warblers, lots of Tennessee warblers, Cat birds, again, lots of Tennessee warblers. Cat birds are the big gray birds. Orioles, like this orchard oriole, and then this Baltimore oriole, everything. Okay, so this obviously was a great spring day on High Island. Um, lots to be found. I want to... Grackles in the background. You know you're in Texas when you're hearing those grackles. Okay, let's see. there we go. Our favorite scarlet tanager with more Tennessee warblers. 
And look at the size difference. So when you're looking through your binoculars, this is the kind of thing you want to know. Oh, there's color. That bird has black wings. Oh, that bird's kind of green on the back. Um, it looks that, like it has some kind of eye stripe. Okay. So, and that's the bird, folks, that dive bound me. This yellow, lemon yellow bird, blackish wings, the prothonotary warbler. Okay. So a fallout is fun. And it's not fun for the birds. I should say that. It's fun for us, the birders. Okay. All right. So some good books you might... Oh, folks, I am so sorry. Some good books you might want to uh, invest in. Um, Songbird Journeys is one of my favorites um, by Miyoko Chu. It's very poetic. It's very lyrical. It's very easy reading. Came out quite a bit ago, maybe 10 years ago. Um, the book for me is um, uh, Living on the Wind by Scott Widensall. Um, it is probably, again, his writing style is so accessible, so fluid, and he explains migration in such beautiful terms. Ken Kaufman's A Season on the Wind just came out last year. Ken Kaufman now lives in northwestern Ohio because his wife is director of the Blackwater Swamp observatory and his book focuses mainly on migration as it occurs in northwestern Ohio especially during uh spring at uh McGee Marsh and other areas up there where you can see 32 species of warbler in a day um and then if you're really scientific if you really like the science of it Paul, I think it's Park Killinger's or Killinger's book, How Birds Migrate Here. And I used to have that one until the storm. Okay, so how can you then attract these, some of these beautiful birds to your yard? Well, it is a lot simpler than you think. And that is with native plants. And I am not a native plant snob, but I am a native plant advocate. You're going to hear Doug Tallamy's name mentioned a lot. Doug Tallamy is the is an entomologist and a professor of entomology, actually. And he is, as as John will tell you, and as I, I know he's his writing is very good, and he makes he he just lays it out plainly. Um, I watched a webinar with him over the summer, and he said our goal for birds should be to make our backyards our own national parks. So I've got Reiner National Park going back there. Why native plants? Well, native plants need less care. They're no muss, no fuss. They don't need, I'm not going to say they don't need any weeding. They do, but they don't need as much. They aren't the princessy roses that you have to worry about, okay? And plus nothing goes to roses. And your objective here is to get insect life in your yard. We have been brainwashed by Dow Chemical and everybody else that insects are bad. No, we want those. Native plants have adapted to our climate for millennia. Our climate, the heat, the humidity, the sun, the soil conditions, the rainfall amounts, they know it. They know Louisiana probably better than we do. Natives help birds and other wildlife. We'll talk about that. Natives help improve depleted soil. Um, they don't need fertilizers. In fact, you can kill natives. You can burn their roots, burn their leaves and their stems with fertilizers. So you don't even need to use fertilizer. I've never fertilized my, my gardens, okay? And it's fantastic. Um, and so they replenish the soil. I was watching this movie on Netflix. Some of you might want to watch. It's called Kiss the Ground. And it's all about how one way we can help climate change is is replenishing and renourishing our soil. And one sure way to do that is through native plants. Native plants help control flooding. There are many projects going on in New Orleans, Orleans Parish right now with rain gardens that are helping control flooding. Um, there are very many groups. WaterWise is one group. Um, um, the Urban Conservancy is another group that will help folks in New Orleans put rain gardens in their yards to prevent flooding and what have you. We have a beautiful legacy in Louisiana of plants. I was getting into, a, I was in a conversation last Saturday with a friend of mine who's also in NPI, and he, he and I were talking about how St. Tammany Parish 
the the plant life, the native plant life there is phenomenal, and it's always has been. Um, in fact, he says it's the best in the state. Now, I know some of my friends in northern Louisiana may argue with that, but this is a great legacy we have. Also, folks, native plants can be less expensive. Those roses are going to cost you a fortune, right? So where do you get natives? I wanted to do this first to make sure it wasn't um, skipped over, but there are several places where you can get native plants in the New Orleans area, in Baton Rouge, and even in Mississippi, in um, Picayune. The Pelican Greenhouse plant sales are going on for Friday, Saturday, Sunday of every weekend, right? And they have a fantastic selection of native plants. There's no admission fee. You just go to the greenhouse on Celebration Drive, to Celebration Drive, go into the greenhouse. They, now they are only allowing a certain number of people there, okay, for obvious reasons. They've got a huge native plant. So they sell other plants too. You know, not all hummingbird plants are natives. Many of them are tropicals. I lost some of those as you did too in the freeze, but I would not skip over this. Also Delta Flora Nursery is run by a friend of mine, Lise. Um, Lise has a really nice operation going over there on Turo Street behind the um, Lowe's on Elysian Fields. And Lise offers a wide arrangement, variety of plants for rain gardens, plants for dry gardens. She's got shrubbery. She, last I checked, she had red mulberry trees. Now remind, remember, these things are dormant. So she, Lise is not selling a, a dead tree. Lise is selling a dormant tree. But Lise has all of these things available for you. And they're so reasonably priced. The Crosby Arboretum, which probably many of you have been to, will have its first <coughs> native plant sale on March 19th, not March 19th and March 20th. If you're a member, you get in early. Um, their selection is not nearly as good as, as Pelican or Delta Flora, um, but they still offer some good things. And then Hilltop Arboretum is having their spring fling uh, plant sale in April. So those are, and that's, Hilltop is in Baton Rouge. So if you find yourself in Baton Rouge, why not head on out that way? And also Hilltop does sell plants ordinarily um, throughout the year. And again, they're a mix of non-natives and natives. So the reason why we are concerned about natives is it's because it's all about the bugs. It is all about bugs. There are very few birds, land birds, species that will feed their offspring seeds. Now, chickadees in your yard are eating seeds in the winter at Christmas time. You could put out those lovely little Christmas wreaths you buy from wherever and with seeds and they'll eat them. But when it comes to nesting time, they're switching over to bugs and a Carolina chickadee alone will need about 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars in a nesting season to feed its young. That's a lot of caterpillars. So if we have only crepe myrtles, if we have only Japanese maples, they're not gonna get those caterpillars. We need, as Doug Tallamy would say, we need the native trees. Uh, Doug Tallamy and one of his students, Desiree Narango, did this fascinating study on chickadees. And they studied yards that had no natives, and yards that had some natives and yards that had plenty of natives. And the difference between the, the birds that were nesting in those yards was amazing. Obviously birds aren't gonna wanna go far from the nest to find insects, okay? And they're more likely to nest where there are gonna be natives, native trees like oaks and things. So you have to think about that evolutionary relationship between the tree and the insect those two things evolved, co-evolved, and then the birds that evolved alongside with them. So let's think in terms of layers. Start with what you have. My neighbor has this beautiful oak tree. I'm so hoping that if she sells the house, the people do not tear this tree down. But your live oaks, your sycamores, your sweet gums, they provide this canopy. They provide not only a canopy for nesting, but also those caterpillars and other insects 
that birds will need. Your smaller trees also provide things. Your magnolias have the seeds and the dogwoods have the uh, blossoms that, that attract a variety of pollinators that the birds will eat. And then obviously you have your fruit producing trees. So Doug Tallamy, and this is by no may, means an exhaustive list, Doug Tallamy has these lists of trees, and I really kind of took out what doesn't grow down here in South Louisiana, but look at number one, the Quercus family, right? The oak trees. 534 species of butterfly moth species supported by an oak tree. Your chickadees will love that, and they will thank you for that, right? We have um, seen chickadees even on some younger oaks that we have on a piece of property. Um, they're not as old as my neighbor's oak tree, but they're still attracting these insects. So you can see it's a wide range of different kinds of trees and many of which will do well down here in southern Louisiana. You want to create an understory. So if you're thinking in terms of layers, you want to go Canopy, understory, native bushes provide that cover that birds need, right? So bushes provide food, they provide shelter, they provide the insects. So the, the yellow bush down here is a spice bush that hosts the spice bush caterpillar, which hosts, which turns into the spice bush butterfly. So think about that. Your understory is just as important. And then finally, the ground layer. So you want those flowers blooming, but you have to know what your sunlight conditions are, your soil conditions, all of those things. You want to know that so you can match them to the plants that will do well in your area. The plants will attract bugs. The bugs will attract the birds, okay? So you want to get both nectar species, you want to get species for nectaring insects, you want to get host species for caterpillars, plant produce, I mean, uh, seed producing plants, uh, like your cone flowers, like your um, sunflowers, leave, get used to dead blooms, leave your dead blooms on, especially your cone flowers, your sunflowers. A friend of mine recorded a video of house finches eating all of the sunflowers out of her dead sunflowers. That's what you want, okay? Leave soil, covered in leaves, leave the leaves there because not only does it work as condition, you get this beautiful, beautiful dark rich soil, but also it creates habitat for native bees because a lot of bees folks, they don't live in hives all year round. They nest in the ground, they nest under leaves. Also some caterpillar species will uh, be underneath your leaves. So let the leaves lie where they are, okay? So, what natives can you get easily at Pelican or at Delta Flora or anywhere else? Echinacea, purpurea, uh, and asterisks are the ones that I have had a lot of success with, either with insects coming to, whether it be um, different species of wasps, assassin bugs, bees, whatever the case may be. Um, your uh, monarda species will attract hummingbirds in addition to bees, uh, mist flower, a good fall blooming, um, uh, goldenrod, folks, goldenrod does not cause allergies. That's ragweed. Goldenrod does not cause allergies. That's ragweed, okay? So goldenrod is a great monarch butterfly attractant. Also bees, Stokes Aster, which I know is for sale at Delta Flora, and I know is for sale at Pelican Greenhouse. Stokes Aster attracts bees galore, okay? Don't cut down your elderberry, because not only do bees love the elderberry and other insects, but birds will eat the berries, obviously, okay? Um, uh, just briefly, Please do not, if you want native, if you're interested in native, if you want to attract wildlife to your yard, do not go to Perinos and buy the flower on the right. Yes, that originated in coneflower, right? It's a coneflower, but it's not a straight native. Straight natives are the echinacea you see on the left, right? They haven't been tampered with. You know, we don't want natives because they 
they don't bloom all year round, or we don't like purple. We want orange, or we want yellow. So scientists have tampered with the genetic makeup of these plants and have changed the bloom size, have changed the leaf size, have changed the bloom duration. All that genetic tampering has ruined the plant for insects. Okay, so there's a huge debate going on now between cultivars or what some people are calling nativars. And it's, it's, it's a pretty heated debate, debate among uh, botanists. Okay, so real required reading for those of you who want to garden with natives. You cannot do it if you don't do it with uh, Bill Fontenot. Shame on you. No, no Bill Fontenot is, is the dude. In fact, he calls himself the nature dude, right? So, but he is, his book is my Bible, so to speak. I don't mean to be disrespectful, but anyone I know, John knows uh, Bill, anyone who knows Bill Fontenot knows, this is the guy to ask questions to, but this is a great book and he gives you everything, everything you need to know in that book. He tells you where to place the plant, what the plant's sun requirements are, what the plant's moisture requirements are. He gives you instructions. He talks about the layering, all that kind of stuff. And then Doug Tallamy's two books, uh, Bringing Nature Home was his first book. That's a fantastic book. Absolutely. This is the, the definitive book, at least for the Eastern half of the United States. And then um, Nature's Hope is, a, Nature's Best Hope is his book that came out in recently, also very good. And then Noah's Garden is, is a classic. I didn't realize how much of a classic it is. I thought people just forgot about it. Sarah Stein has since passed away, but her book is just phenomenal. And it talks about how she bought a house in New York, upstate New York with huge acreage, took out all the non, the grandiflora roses and all that stuff and planted native trees and all that kind of stuff. Very interesting. And then I've got here for some links, um, my shameless plug for NPI, Native Plant Initiative. We are going to have a big project at Big Lake coming up on March 20th, where we are uh, working on our native gardens at Big Lake and City Park. Also, National Audubon has a Plants for Birds campaign where it, you could plug in your zip code and it'll tell you what plants will work well. National Wildlife Federation does the same thing. They also have that. So take a photograph of this. Um, Louisiana Native Plant Society doesn't really have a, a fantastic website, but we're working on it. And then uh, those of you who remember Lady Bird Johnson, wildflower.org is Lady the Lady Bird Johnson. She was the guru of getting uh, wildflowers back in our highways and byways. That's a fantastic website where you can do research on that website. I'm going to make a Mecca there. If it kills me, I'm going to go to Austin to go there. Okay, so just quickly, bird feeders, you know, if you've got a problem with sparrows, if you're in Jefferson Parish like I am in Metairie, and you have a problem with too many house sparrows, I would stick with black flower sun, black, I'm sorry, black oil, sunflower seeds. I would stay away from the millet and things like that because then the sparrows go crazy over that. Feeders are all up to you. What do you want to use? Just hang them somewhere where a cat cannot get them. Cat is the elephant in the room, of course. Um, where do the birds have a safe play to fly off to, to flit to? Is there a tree or a bush nearby? If you don't want squirrels, I've given up worrying about squirrels, folks, but if you don't want squirrels, plant, put your feeders away from where a squirrel can jump or use a big baffle. I have a baffle and the squirrels can't get, get up there, but hygiene is really important, folks. You want to keep your feeders clean. Um, Plant good seed producing and fruit producing plants for birds. So your goldenrod, again, remember goldenrod does not cause allergies. Your American, your American beauty berry, um, the purple berry there, beautiful berries. It's also called French mulberry. Beautiful bush, takes part shade, takes part sun, could be moist, could be dry. Mockingbirds and thrushes eat those berries like they're going out of style. Texas coneflower on top, let the seed head die and birds will come at it. Because these, again, evolution planned this. Mother Nature's not dumb. Many of these coneflowers bloom in the fall. What's coming through in the fall? Birds. So birds will find these um, 
plants like the goldenrods that have gone to seed. And then your mulberry trees on the bottom. Oh my gosh, if you want to see a happy birder, go to a mulberry tree in April and you will see a birder who doesn't care about anything other than what's going on in that mulberry tree for species that eat berries like your tanagers, um, your, some of your um, other ones like robins and thrushes. Hummingbirds, real quickly, this is not my photograph, but this is what I have in my yard right now, this buff-bellied hummingbird. Um, hummingbird nectar should never be red. There's no need for the red dye. It's not healthy for the birds. You can simply make your own one part sugar to four parts water. Um, I use these tiny little feeders because hummingbirds are territorial. It doesn't matter if they're male or female, they're territorial. So I plant these things throughout my yard and the rufus likes the front yard, the buff belly likes the backyard. And so, you know, never the twain meet, they do. It's not a pretty sight when they do because you um, in warm weather, you want to keep your feeders clean. So like every two, three days, I clean out my feeders because mold will grow in and it'll definitely kill them. Uh, make the birds sick. Also hang these feeders where, again, something cannot get at them, a cat, um, somewhere where they have cover to uh, fly to. Again, I like the mini hummingbird feeders. Leave your feeders up all year round. I made the big mistake in November of not putting my feeders back up. And I heard this buff belly because buff belly sort of announced their presence. They have sort of click, 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 click sound and you could hear them. And I'm like, dummy, I might lose this bird because I didn't keep my feeder up. But fortunately, that was November. The bird is still here. We saw him today looking a little bedraggled or her, I don't know which it is in the weather. So natives for hummingbirds, again, uh, Delta Flora has them. Uh, in fact, Delta Flora just put out an email saying that the, the uh, coral honeysuckle on top, which is a native honeysuckle, is available. It doesn't look too good right now because these plants go dormant. Natives will go dormant. But in spring, it'll flesh out and start growing. And coral honeysuckles attract hummingbirds and they are fast growers. Um, any of your lobelia species on the left is your cardinal flower. And on the right, I am happy to say I just bought myself my first red buckeye tree that I'm gonna plant in the backyard. Um, I have had great luck with hummingbirds at Gulf Coast Penstemon. It only grows about this tall, but the hummingbird is down there feeding on it. Now, I couldn't figure out why this uh, link on the bottom here didn't highlight, but this is put out by the um, somebody, I think it's the Forest Service, yeah, the Forest Service, and it's all about plants, native plants for hummingbirds. So you might want to take a photograph of that and look that up. It's a, it's a long brochure, it's like 16 pages long. Okay, so there are plenty of natives that will bloom in time for the hummingbirds to come. So thank you very much because you are what hope looks like to a bird. Thank you for coming. Get planting, get your binoculars out, and I certainly hope to meet some of you very soon. Thanks a lot.